On today's show, we will be joined by senior staff writer for the Dallas Stars, Mike Heike, to talk all things Dallas Stars offseason. We'll talk about Peter DeBoer's hire as the new head coach, talk about which players we think can improve the most under his system, and then, of course, talk about the prospects we think could potentially see the NHL roster this season, all coming up on a midweek episode of Locked on Stars. Your Locked On Stars, your daily podcast on the Dallas Stars. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Howdy, Stars fans. Welcome back to the Locked On Stars podcast, the only daily podcast in season covering the Dallas Stars, part of the Locked On podcast network your team every day i'm your host dane lewis your local expert on all things dallas stars hockey credentialed member of the dallas stars media coming to you on this wednesday august 16th and whether this is your first time here or you are a recurring listener of the show thank you for stopping by today's episode and for making locked on stars your first listen every single day please do hit that subscribe button on YouTube, if that's where you're watching slash listening, we are trying to reach 1,000 subscribers by the end of 2022. So help us out on that journey by hitting that subscribe button if you are not already subscribed. You can also find and follow us on your favorite podcasting platform. We are free and available no matter where or how you choose to listen. Also, before we jump into today's episode with Mike Kaika, I do want to remind you to be on the lookout on Twitter and the YouTube community page for this channel for a Friday mailbag prompt. If you want your question to be featured on Friday's show, be sure to either reply to the tweet or respond in a comment to the YouTube community page post. But without any further hesitation, let's get into today's episode interview with Dallas Star senior staff writer, Mike Heike. All right, now joining me on the show, we've had him on before, but it has been quite some time, senior staff writer for the Dallas Stars, Mike Heike. And Mike, I know that we were just talking a second ago, the, the offseason, we are full on in the, the dog days of the NHL offseason. But, you know, how is, how is this uh, time off treating you and how excited are you for the return of, of hockey and, you know, just, I guess... A little over a month from now with training camp starting up at the end of September. Yeah, I'm uh, making my travel plans to Traverse City right now. So that's pretty fun. Um, I grew up in Traverse City that my parents uh, live there. And uh, so it, it's, um, I mean, it's a couple of weeks away for me uh, to go watch the prospects play. And then uh, that heads right into training camp and preseason. I mean, heck, training camp's what, three days now. <laughs> so it's not even real. Uh, then that goes into preseason. And uh, yeah, it won't be long at all. So I, I'm very excited. Uh, it's very slow in the summertime here uh, with 100 degree temperatures. Um, so I'm I'm really looking forward to uh, what they've done. Yeah, absolutely. It's uh, set to be an exciting season. And of course, it does all start with preseason, the training camp and even the, the Traverse City tournament. I know the Stars have plenty of exciting prospects, some of whom who We'll, uh, we'll touch on here in a little bit, but kind of want to pick your brain a little bit on some of the things that have happened this offseason within the Stars organization, starting with kind of the the man in charge of the team behind the bench. I know that uh, we saw Rick Bonus um, depart from the team. He's now in Winnipeg, which we'll talk about that in a second as well. But what were your thoughts on the, the Peter DeBoer hire? I know it feels like a lifetime ago, just how long this summer has been. Uh, I know for, for myself and you as well, and I'm sure many of the listeners at home, but what were your some initial thoughts on Pete DeBoer and how do you think this team uh, will perform and how do you think they're going to look different this season under his leadership? Well, there's two two parts of all this. One, I think they needed to make a change because the situation that Rick Bonus walked into was very awkward. Um, he didn't get to name his own assistants. Uh, they made the best of the situation. But even, even when they were going through it, um, I, I do believe they were... Um, Awkward is the best word I have for it, is they were a staff that, you know, they were just there. Uh, they each tried very hard. I think they all did a pretty good job. I mean, obviously, they got the Stanley Cup final, um, but it was it was not how you would put together a coaching staff. And so that, in, in my mind, makes the Pete DeBoer staff a step up already. Uh, and then two, uh, when you start researching uh, Pete DeBoer and what happened in Vegas, um, one, uh, he did a really good job there. Two, he was pretty surprised that he got fired. Um, so when you look at the two seasons previous to this season, uh, they were one of the best teams in the NHL. 
When you look at last season, they missed the playoffs. They had a lot of injuries. Um, so then the question becomes, you know, was this a coaching issue or was this just manpower? They didn't have the, the people that they needed. Uh, I'm going to go with manpower. Uh, I think the, the Vegas team under Pete DeBoer was really good. Um, now he, he wobbled a little bit in San Jose, but if you look at his puck possession, he's a guy who he, his teams have the puck more than other teams. And I've always liked those teams. Um, you know, the stars obviously have struggled, uh, with shots on goal. Uh, they're always, they're always pretty low on shots against and goals against, but they're hard on getting, creating offensive opportunities and then cashing in. And uh, Pete DeBoer's teams definitely create offensive opportunities. Uh, so I look at all that, and I think this could be really good. And then his two assistant coaches, I think, are going to be guys who, you know, can help push a few buttons with some of these players. Uh, so I'm very excited about it. I, I think it's a, a good move. Um, the Stars needed a guy like Pete DeBoer, and I think Pete DeBoer needed this opportunity. I think he's going to be incredibly motivated. Uh, to prove Vegas wrong, and we'll see what happens. Yeah, I, I too am growing more and more excited the more I, I look into his previous teams. Obviously, that he kind of has the the stigma of having a great first season with his respective teams, reaching the Cup final with the Devils and the Sharks, and then even the the Western Conference Finals with the Golden Knights, where they did eventually get eliminated by the Stars back in the bubble. Uh, so a lot to be excited about with Pete DeBoer. And one part I'm looking forward to the most. You talk about the you know DeBoer maybe needing this opportunity, a fresh start with a new team. He also is reuniting with a, an old player of his and debate one of the best players he's ever coached in Joe Pavelski and you know it's hard to imagine Joe taking his game to a new height as he just you know set a, a career high in just about every statistical category but what most excites you about getting to see that duo reunite because I think there's a lot of interesting you know storylines that could develop both guys looking to to win a Stanley Cup Joe certainly near the end of his career and uh, like you said DeBoer coming in for a fresh start so what excites you most about that duo uh, getting back together? Well, I think every coach needs an in into the uh, leadership group. And so when you take a, a position like this and you're trying to, uh, I don't know, win over the team, because you do have to win over the team and, and you need to get them on your side and you can sit there and say, oh, they're going to, to go for a new coach. They're going to be excited. But, but there's a buy-in process. And I think Joe Pavelski helps a great deal with that. Uh, it's interesting watching last year with uh, Ryan Suter. Uh, I didn't know much about Ryan Suter, but he didn't have a great reputation up in Minnesota. He was, you know, kind of seen as a, a locker room lawyer, maybe a guy who was too friendly with ownership and all of those things. And and now he gets put in a completely new team in a completely different situation. And you watched him and Pavelski, who are good friends from Wisconsin, and they just bonded. They just had that natural bond. And now their kids play on the same hockey team. So they're spending a lot of time together away from the rink as well. Um, but it was just really interesting because I was very impressed with what Ryan Suda did last year for a 37 year old defenseman who, you know, you kind of expected to play on the second pairing or third pairing. And I mean, he played 23, 24 minutes a game and was really, his numbers say he was really good. He, you know, he took a step down in the playoffs, but he was really good during the regular season. And I do believe that having a guy like Joe Pavelski around was huge for him. So I see that and I'm tracking it over and saying, well, why couldn't he do the same thing for Pete DeBoer? Why couldn't he make Pete DeBoer feel comfortable? And why couldn't he help, you know, get all these guys together and on the same page? I do believe Joe Pavelski is one of the top leaders on the team right now, and, and the stars are very lucky to have him. You're hanging out with some friends and putting back a few drinks. A few becomes a few too many, and as the evening comes to an end and people start to head out, you think of calling a ride. Nah, you live nearby. You can make it home. It's no big deal. What are the odds you get pulled over anyway? And even so... What's the worst that could happen? Your insurance goes up, you lose your license, you lose your job, you total your car, you kill somebody? Everyone knows about the risks of drunk driving. The results are tragic and often deadly. However, that still doesn't stop everyone from getting behind the wheel while under the influence. That's why police officers are out there right now looking for impaired drivers on our road to save lives. So if you think you're okay to drive after a few drinks, think again. Play it safe and plan ahead to get a ride. It only takes one mistake to change your life or someone else's forever. Drive sober or get pulled over.
Absolutely, uh, a great ad ever since he's been, you know, put on this team. A, a great leader to to join alongside the likes of Jamie Benn and Tyler Sagan and even John Klingberg, uh, who now is no longer with the team. But when he was here, you know, a guy that had been long tenured with the Stars and uh, a great leader for that defensive group. And you know, we talk about Peter DeBoer, and then of course there is the the Rick Bonus hire in Winnipeg. Is that a move that surprised you, uh, or is that a move in your head that makes sense? Uh, you know, going forward for this team? Because I, I know for me, I was maybe expecting him to to take a season or two off and then maybe hear his name somewhere else. But it seemed like things were, you know, kind of just happened out of nowhere with that move. Yeah, it did surprise me because I truly believe Rick's one of the best um, top assistants in the NHL. Uh, what he did with uh, the Stars when he first came here was great. Uh, he, he is very mm, dynamic and he gets guys on his side uh, he cares about the players. He knows how to mold defensemen, um, and he's great at coaching the penalty kill. So I, I really thought he would go in, and I thought a good team would hire him as their defensive assistant coach, and he would do a great job on, on a contender. I mean, he said uh, at his last press conference he really wanted to be on a contender, and, and you can argue that Winnipeg is. Um, so that it really did surprise me. Now, when I look back and look at what Winnipeg has gone through, and it appeared, I mean, the coach stepped down and said, I, they're not listening to me or I can't get through to them or whatever it was that he said at the time. That's pretty damning. And so I think as a GM or ownership, you're like, OK, what guy can I get in here who can bring all these players together? And Rick Bonus is that guy. Uh, if it, You know, if you didn't like his defensive style or if you didn't like his in-game decisions, I get it. But if you talk to the players, they loved him. And when you look at the bubble and you look at the, you know, what it took for them to get to the Stanley Cup final, uh, a lot of that was Rick Bonus. Uh, the fact that he was positive and at the same time, you know, pushed the right buttons. And he just made everybody a family. He cared about people. He knew about people. He'd ask you about your kids. He, you know, he was just a really good catalyst for a family feeling of a team and Winnipeg. I think Winnipeg needs that right now. Yeah. And, and I think it will make Winnipeg one of those teams, a team that I think Dallas was a lot of last season where they're never an easy play, regardless of if you're playing a, a top team in the league or a bottom team in the league, you know that you're going to get a really physical team that's motivated, like you said, by, by the coaching style that Rick brings to the table. So that's going to make things interesting for the stars. I know even last year, all, all four games between the clubs were entertaining. And I believe all four went to overtime uh, and required extra minutes. So well, they got they have great forward talent and a number one goalie. Uh, the defense is a little bit shaky, but I mean, you can go a long way with great forward talent and a, and a guy if he plays the way he has in the past. That that's a great goalie up there. Absolutely, yeah, Connor Hellebuck, one of the one of the better goalies in the league, and you know maybe just was overshadowed by some other great play uh, this past season. So yeah, I'm excited to see what bonus can can do up in Winnipeg and kind of shifting the focus to to some of the players here on the Stars roster. Kind of want to throw some names. Uh, your way to see how they might perform this season in Pete DeBoer's system. A lot of these guys I know you've been covering, uh, writing for the Stars, kind of these you know middle-of-the-pack guys, not the big-name players, but guys that can still certainly have an impact on the team. Uh, and do want to start with one of the bigger-name players, a guy that I know a lot of people now, the expectation was already high, but now with the departure of John Klingberg, uh, is probably at an all-time high with Miro Haskin, and plenty of people know that his, you know the defensive game is there, but it's the, the offense and the goal scoring that we wanted to see more from. So what, do, what should we expect this season from Miro Haskin as far as offensive production? Well, the hope is that it'll be significant. Uh, I think he was 45th uh, in points per game among defensemen last year, which, you know, when you're talking about a number one defenseman who a lot of people feel should be in the conversation for the Norris Trophy, that that just doesn't cut it. So he does have to to boost those numbers. Now he played, I think it was 30 seconds less per game on the power play than John did. So clearly John was running the first power play. Mira was running the second power play. You know, it, there is something to be said for if you're going to be a point scorer, you need to be out there with the first power play unit. Uh, so those two things alone should help him. The other thing is, is that uh, Pete DeBoer has a history of activating his defensemen, using his defensemen to score points. Um, and, and that should help Miro. Um, the big controversy and, and yeah, I'm, I'm on the side. I would love to see Miro play the left side. Um, 
I just think he would be, it's a more natural position. If you could find a skilled right-handed defenseman to be his partner, uh, that could be a really good thing. Um, but they just, I don't know. I, I don't think Colin Miller's that guy. I don't know that you want him, you know, playing 22, 24 minutes a game. We'll see. Um, but that was a little bit surprising during free agency or in the off season. I believe they, you know, they threw their hat in the ring for a couple of right-handed defensemen in trades um, and just couldn't pull them off. Uh, so that'll be very interesting. Now, <laughs> The stars get a little touchy when you, you know, say these things and, and they're like, well, Miro can do anything. And I go, yeah, he can, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't put him in the best position for him to be one of the best players in the league. Uh, so I think Miro will play the right side. Now, once you get that established, well, who does he play with? Uh, is Essa the best combination? Because he's not that skilled. And would that slow Miro down at all? Is Ryan Suter the best? Combination they played together last year and looked pretty good, but you know he's 37 years old. Is Thomas Harley the best combination? Well, could he step up and and be that guy already? You know, uh, so there's a lot of pieces to the puzzle that we need to see him on the ice uh, before we can decide exactly what the potential is. I mean, I think Miro's points will go up. Uh, the other interesting discussion point on all this is. And we're just trying to read into people's heads, but it sure seems like Miro is a guy who's not going to step on anybody's toes. He's a very polite, very kind person. And John was a guy who he wanted to spotlight. He wanted to be the number one defense and he wanted to be on the number one power play. And he made that clear. And so now with that presence out of the room, does Miro naturally just have to step up? And does he have to play 25 minutes? And does he have to be, you know, the dominant defenseman who controls the puck and has it on a stick the whole time? Um, we'll see. I think he will. I think, you know, one, with his experience, and two, with the fact that he is their best chance on the blue line now, uh, I think he'll step up and, and say, you know, it's, it's me. I got to do this. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's encouraging because we've seen him before, you know, perform at a high level, even back as in the 2020 playoffs. Uh, and even, you know, this season, he had so many bright moments, obviously had that stint of, of mononucleosis that, you know, kept him down for a little bit. And so hopefully we'll, we'll get a full, fully healthy season for Miro and we can maybe see him a little bit more, you know, unleashed on the offensive side of the ice. I think that'll be really exciting. I, we don't know what he can do. I mean, everybody who watches him says he has incredible skill. Then you look at the end of the season, he's got whatever, 36 points. And you're like, mm, you know, can he do more than this? Well, I guess we're going to find out. Today's episode of Locked on Stars is brought to you by our friends at betonline.net. BetOnline is the fastest and easiest way to check in on all of your betting needs. Find all your favorite sports and events at the number one online source for odds, lines, and games. Find reviews and news of every league, including Major League Baseball, NFL, NBA, NHL, combat sports, esports, and even golf. BetOnline continues to be the top online resource for all your sports wagering information from live in-game betting, scores, and podcasts. Head to BetOnline today or use your mobile device to learn more about the action happening today. BetOnline.net is where the game starts. I, I think Stars fans know that, you know, he's a very capable player, and I think this could be a year where the rest of the NHL finally does, you know, rope him into that that conversation with your your Roman Yossi's, your Kale McCarr, Adam Fox's, uh, which I think is really exciting because, I mean, we're paying Miro Haskin and uh, like those players, so... I think it'll be really great for this team if he's able to put up those numbers. And you mentioned Thomas Harley going through the the other defenseman, a guy who's also expected to take on uh, likely a bigger role this season. You know, he's kind of been acclimated to the NHL slowly but surely. What what kind of output can we expect from him this season? What makes him a special player that he was taken, I believe, first round in 2019? Now you can correct me if I'm wrong there. Oh, that's right. Uh, he is a special player. He has talent. Um, he has uh, athletic arrogance. Uh, which I think can be a good thing. I think uh, uh, Jason Robertson has the same thing where his personality is not arrogant, but when he's on the ice, he thinks he's the best player. And so with Harley, um, 
it, it's been interesting. And, and we've seen this in the past. Stars fans have seen this with so many young defensemen where, you know, they make a mistake, the, the coach either benches them or scratches them and they lose confidence. Um, and so, you know, it's been a process for the young defensemen to come through and, and, you know, just find that place where they're just playing the game, where they're not thinking too much. And I think that this could be the season for Harley. I, I personally think he needs to play in the top four. Um, you know, if, if that's uh, with uh, Hawk and Pa on the second pair, uh, that's fine. Um, you know, we'll see. If I guess if he plays with Colin Miller on the third pair, uh, that could be a good fit for him as well, because Colin Miller is a skilled skating player. Uh, but but he needs to he needs to be a regular in the lineup every night. And uh, if he makes a mistake, he makes a mistake. Uh, I think uh, one of the best things that ever happened for Jamie Alexiak uh, was when he went to Pittsburgh. Uh, they kind of looked at him that way, and when he came back, they looked at him that way. And so then he just stopped worrying so much. And, and I do think that's huge for young defensemen. So if, if Thomas can get out there, get the reps, get the minutes, and get the confidence, I, I think he'll be a great player. Yeah, and, and I think that'll be great, again, for this fan base, for this team to have Miro Haskin in. And then if you can have Harley, uh, maybe not be quite the same player, because I think there are maybe some differences there, but to still produce at a high level uh, and maybe somewhat be a, a, a Klingberg replacement uh you know, for lack of a better term, I think that that will be a nice step forward for this team. And uh, like you said, Pete DeBoer has a history of, you know, getting the most out of his defensemen. So hopefully we can see Thomas Harley added to that list. But, you know, shifting our, our focus a little bit to the forward position and some of these these middle six guys. I mean, you look at all the successful teams in the past few years. I mean, you have your, your big name players on the, you know, the Colorado Avalanche. You have McKinnon and you know, Landis Gog, Rantanen, but you got to have those middle six guys, whether it's a, a Val Nachuskin or uh, even a guy, a former Dallas star, um, Andrew Cogliano. You got to have those guys in the middle that, that are kind of the, the backbone of the team. And one guy that I'm really interested in this season, because I really liked him last season, one of the newer additions, Luke Glendinning. I know Michael Roffel has departed. I think both of them had a similar game and they, they played a lot together kind of on that checking line. But what can the expectation be for Luke going into this season? I think if he just does what he does, He'll be great. Um, the, the biggest question I have for Luke and for the, the middle six is, you know, will Ty DeLandria be a candidate to play in the second line? Will Wyatt Johnston be a candidate to play in the second line? Because if they are, now you've got Marchment. Let's say you have Wyatt Johnston and then you have Sagan at the right wing. Then your third line all of a sudden becomes something very interesting. Is it Jamie Benn? Is it, you know, uh, uh, Radic Foxa? Is it Luke Glendening? Is it Dennis Garyanov? Um, so where Luke Glendening plays will have a lot to do with who he is. Is he your third line right wing? Is he your fourth line center? Is he a little bit of both? Uh, he can do it both. He can, in, you know, change pretty effortless, effortlessly uh, from position to position. So I, I'm kind of curious how all this shakes up. Um, I believe that somebody needs to step up. And if it's Tyler, it's Tyler. That's great. It'd be the best thing in the world if he can be the number two center. Uh, but if he needs to be the right wing, uh, then somebody needs to step up in that number two center spot. And whether that's Delandria, whether that's Wyatt Johnston, you know, if you had to go with, with Marchment, uh, Tyler, and then, uh, 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 oh my gosh, my brain's not working here. Uh, Giryanov on the right wing, uh, that wouldn't be a terrible second line. So now you come with that, and then Jamie's on the third line. But if if indeed Marchment's your second line left wing, Jamie's a third line player. And so then I think that changes for Radic Foxa, for Luke Glendening, for whoever you decide to play on that third line, it, it can't be just a line that gets you know, six goals from all three players. You, you've got to become a line, like you said, that, you know, a Calgary or a Tampa Bay or a, Chicago or a Colorado has that can add scoring throughout the year. That That's what the top teams have is a third line like that. Yeah, and I mean, so many, you know, interesting forwards coming in, even to this training camp season, especially on the young side. You talk about the the prospects, and even a guy like Ty Delandria, who, 
you know, had a surprising, really good game seven in the, in that Calgary series, a guy that, you know, I'm excited to see how he performs during camp in the preseason. Uh, and another guy who, you know, maybe gets lost on this. I know I'm quick to forget him, but then looking back at this past season, he was one of the pleasant surprises, Jacob Peterson. Uh, where, where do you see him fitting in in all this? Do you think he could be potentially a, a second, third line guy, or, you know, where, where do you think his role could be in all this? Cause he's a, a, a very intriguing player. Cause he'd have, you know, flashes of, you know, really good scoring, and then he would kind of go silent for a little bit. It was, I mean, which, you know, you expect in a rookie season. Yeah, and, and I do think he's a lot like Yoel Kibiranta in that um, they're smart players. Uh, they don't make a lot of mistakes. So those are things that earns respect from the coaching staff, and they have enough skill where they can play with skilled players. So could they be on the second line? I don't know. I mean, a lot will depend on injuries and stuff. Um, but, yeah, having guys like that, um, you know, is is very important. Student Nietzsche, I think, is another one who's, you know, skilled guy, still pretty good defensively, uh, could fit in a lot of different places. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what the board and the staff decide on these guys. And, and you know, like I said, I go, I go up and down and, and let's say you're not going to mess with the first line. I just don't think you should. So then now the second line is Marchment there. Well, you signed him kind of to be that guy. So now you got to find your second line center and your right wing. And then is Jamie your third line left wing? It almost seems like he has to be unless you decide you want him to center the third line. And, you know, so there's different elements. And then when the main pieces fall into place, then your, you know, then your Kibi Rantas and your, and your other guys fall into place and, and they're going to get moved around, especially with the new coaching staff. I think they're going to experiment a lot early in the season. Yeah, it almost feels like maybe a good problem to have of just so many different forwards you can you can use. I mean, you even look at guys that play, made their debuts last season, whether it's O'Reilly Tufty, Damiani, uh, Carlstrom. I mean, seems like they have a, a plethora of options on top of their their guys that have been playing with their junior clubs and kind of shifting the focus to those those guys, especially the what I would call the big three: Johnston, Stankoven, and Bork. Which of those three guys do you think has the best shot to to potentially crack the NHL roster this season? Well, part of it is academic, or um, just the administrative part of it. So if Johnston plays, he has to play the whole year because mm -hmm. he's still the junior guy who has a year left of eligibility. You either play in junior hockey, you play in the NHL. So they have to make that decision in training camp in the first nine games of the regular season. Um, I like him. Uh, now, he, he wasn't healthy at the, at the development camp. Uh, I'm not exactly sure, you know, what his position will be for Traverse City. Um, but if he's not healthy, he'll probably go back. If he is healthy, I really would like to see them give him every opportunity to play here. Um, then I think Bork, you know, because he can go to the AHL, uh, there's a really good chance he might go down there for whatever, 20, 30, 40 games, get his leg legs underneath him, prove to the organization that he can do this, and then maybe he's a candidate to come up. Um, Stan Coven is as good as he is. Um, he's again, he's on the Maverick Bork or on the um, Wyatt Johnston plan, and that he has to come to the Stars or he has to go back to junior hockey. Well, <laughs> I don't know that they're going to actually say it this way, but his team, Kamloops, is already hosting the Memorial Cup. So that means his team will be in the Memorial Cup. Tom Gallardi owns Kamloops. <laughs> <laughs> if he's going to have his team in the Memorial Cup in that in Canadian junior hockey, he sure would like to have one of the best players in the league there. So I think all that plays out to Stan Coven will probably play in junior hockey and go the whole season there. And that's my guess, uh, just because of the logic around everything. Uh, but I do think that Johnston has a chance, and I do think that Bork uh, will – I don't think he'll come in out of camp. It's a big jump. Um but I do think that he's a guy who could be one of those who come in after 20, 30, 40 games of AHL play. And all of a sudden now we got some injuries and we need some skilled uh, players or he just tears up the AHL so much that they have to put him on. Yeah, I, I think that that makes a lot of sense. And I think, you know, the closer that we get to, you know, potentially seeing those guys debut, especially Bork. I know there's been plenty of hype surrounding him since he was drafted. And I've had several people tell me that, that you know, know the prospect level really well that he's probably the best piece in our our prospect pipeline which is exciting to hear but you know Johnson and Stan Coven aren't too far off and 
of course, plenty of other really intriguing players as well. Kind of the last thing I want to talk about, the draft a few, uh, you know, several weeks ago, but plenty of exciting players, mostly defensemen taken in the, the draft by the Stars. Is there a name or maybe two names that really is, excite you the most of that draft class? Um, it's interesting because Alian, uh, I think, I get the idea that he's one of those that could take a few years. You know, the Riley Tufty type where, you know, we'll see, and I don't know him well enough to say that, but my first impression is this is a guy who could take two or three years. The next three, the three righties, uh, any one of those I think could step up. And that's the star's history, basically. The Jason Robertsons, the um, uh, who else has come out of that group? Uh, well, Rope, um, mm -hmm. you know, where this guy who was taking a second round, a third round, but really looks like kind of a little bit of a high-end player. Uh, they got three of those, I think, in the next uh, three rounds. And, and I'm really encouraged by that. And and then, you know, as I go back to Miro playing the left or right side, having enough right-handed defensemen is huge. Uh, so they can even get one or two out of those three. Uh, that will be great. Uh, but I like them. And, and again, the process is they got to go back. They got to prove themselves. They got to take the next step. Um, but I do believe that those three are the ones I would concentrate on and uh, and see if you know one of those could be kind of one of the bus through players. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think it's great that there was so much focus on that defensive position to to build around Miro Haskin in that defensive core. Cause I mean, at the end of the day, a lot of these other guys on that core aren't going to be around forever. I mean, Ryan Suter, similar to, to Joe Pavelski, probably, you know, nearing the end of his career and even, you know, Essa Lindell, Yanni Hockenpah, guys that are kind of in their young to you know mid 30s so guys that aren't going to be around forever but Miro Haskin and we know with his contract and his his age likely going to you know be a staple of this team for a while so you got to you know build around him and, and make sure that defensive core stays strong and sturdy and able to uh to help Jake Ottinger out as much as they can well and you look at that group of forwards too I mean you can't promise all of them are going to work out but they're looking pretty good right now so they really I mean if you're just guessing on 20 21 22 year old forwards you know, and you mix in Robertson and you mix in Hints and you work mix in Delandria, they're kind of set with their forward group. Uh, so if those guys pan out and then some of these D-men pan out, then they really could be a pretty good team for years to come if Jake is Jake, you know, for 10 years, to you know, down the road. Yeah, and, you know, certainly from what we've seen from him in the first, you know, two outings, two seasons he's had, uh, and even those, that seven-game series against the Flames, I mean, that was maybe the, the best performance we saw from a goaltender throughout the whole playoffs, and it's a, a shame he only got to play one round because I think he could have, you know, kept it going, and who knows who knows how he could have performed past that. So, yeah. Well, Mike, I appreciate you coming on the show, and uh, always a pleasure to, to talk hockey with you, and we'll, we'll have to do it again sometime soon, maybe as we get a little bit closer to the season. That'd be great. I enjoy it. I honestly do. Certainly hope you enjoyed today's chat with Mike Heike. Always appreciate and value his insight. A uh, guy who knows his stuff as far as Dallas Stars and just hockey in general. Always a great conversation. Always a pleasure to have Mike on the show. Be sure to check him out on Twitter and on the Dallas Stars website with all of his writing if you do not do so already because his stuff is great. Thank you guys for tuning in today and for making Locked on Stars your first listen of the day. Remember again to subscribe on YouTube if you have not already done so. Help us reach 1,000 subscribers by the end of 2022. You can also follow and subscribe to the show on your favorite podcasting platform and leave us a five-star rating and review if you like what you hear. You can also find and follow me on Twitter at Dane double underscore Lewis and our show as well. Just a simple at Locked on Stars. Thank you guys again for tuning in. Be on the lookout on Twitter and on YouTube for the Mailbag Friday prompt. We will be back here on Friday with a special Mailbag episode. You won't want to miss it. Have a great Wednesday, Stars fans.